Is this thing on? All right, the audiovisual guy was not wrong. We're just gonna keep this going. Okay, um, so thank you, first of all, David, for giving me the opportunity to do this. I love sharing learning lessons. It's a part of my job and it's a part of me. So this is fun to do again. Um, the story I'm gonna tell you today is kind of all about how I didn't know what the hell I was doing for most of my career, but that it oddly prepared me for what I'm doing now, a job that I'm really excited about at Acquia that I just really adore. And all those wrongs turned into a big right. So that's where I'm going with this, in case you're like, why is she telling me so many things? So when I started out as a youngling many moons ago, we won't say how many, <laughs> um, I wanted to be a developer. I was like, I love making things and I wanna be an architect and figure this out and oh my gosh, my thing works and this is amazing. I felt really excited about it. I thought that's gonna be my career. By the way, I should say before that, I wanted to be a professional flautist and a French teacher. So on the spectrum of things that I'm interested in, it's very wide. Um, but in this case, I wanted to be a developer. I was really passionate about it and I was really into it and I decided I'm gonna go to school for this. And um, I went to college and I started, you know, learning how to do things, learning Java and all this stuff. And I realized I was terrible. <laughs> I was that person who was like at two in the morning working on their thing, on their little program, and just calling up all of my guy friends, because I was the only girl in the class, by the way, and calling them up and being like, I don't know why this won't run. Here's my error message. Blah, 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 blah. And um, it would always be a period or a semicolon, and I wanted to just shoot myself. So after about you know a couple of years of that, and then a couple of years of actually doing programming in Cold Fusion, <laughs> wait, yeah, you can laugh. Um, I decided, all right, that's it, I'm, I'm giving up on this. But I'm staying in this field because I like IT, so I'm gonna do design. Maybe I just was in the wrong, maybe I was like, you know, in the wrong fields, so I'm gonna do design. So then I did design. I was not so great at that either. Um, I didn't do the most beautiful things. <laughs> they were better than some other ones, but I wasn't talented uh, in my own opinion at that time. I didn't realize that I had to like actually do tons and tons and tons and tons and like really train and learn and study in order to become a good designer because I was young and naive. But anyway, that was another thing I was wrong about. So then I moved into um, information architecture and I realized that that was really boring to me. <laughs> I just wasn't interested in it at all. So that was another thing I was wrong about. And then I moved into uh, project management and that kind of stuck, like I really liked it. I did that for about 10 years. And all of those things, like having done Oh, I did UX and UI as well, but I wasn't super great at that either, by the way, <laughs> so that was another thing. So I was like, wrong, 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 wrong. Uh, pretty good, that's a pretty good fit. And today, I am a program manager. And I realize why this is such a good fit for me. In one part, it's because I learned about all of those things, all of those wrong decisions, all of those years wasted in career paths that were not for me, clearly, ended up being super valuable to me today. When I talk to developers, I can understand where they're coming from. When I talk to designers, I know how hard their job is to get someone to describe what they want. It's really, really hard. UXers and UIs, how underappreciated this like, career is and how immensely valuable it can be and how great it is. So I can come at those people and the project managers, how they just feel like secretaries. Oh my God, do I get it? So now when I'm cross-functional, and I'm talking to different groups in different parts, I'm dealing with all these things. I am so grateful that I screwed up so bad so many times because now I have this beautiful perspective on everyone's problems and all their pain points and what they care about because I've literally been in their shoes for a short time when I was just wrong and stupid. Um, so that's my, my lesson learned is that you might feel at the time that you're making the biggest mistake like me in picking four or five different careers, probably many more in my head, and trying them out, you might feel, God, why can't I just get this right? Other people know what they like. They know how to do this. And I'm this one idiot who just can't seem to figure out what the hell she's doing and keeps trying all these things and failing at them. But it might actually end up being the best thing for you because you learn from that. And you find out this isn't a fit, but 
the why is what was more important to me. And I understood for myself what I cared about and what I liked. I think it was maybe kind of a kiss a, kiss a lot of frogs to find your prince situation. And um, I hope that everyone in this room, when you screw something up, feel bad about it, of course, because then it motivates you not to do it again. But also, just like learn from it. What can you learn about yourself? What can you learn about other people? How does this enrich your life? And for me, that was the best lesson that I could take from failing at like five careers. So that's how I was wrong. That was only five minutes. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is John Ferris. I work for Ad Design Group. Um, David's not here, but I did want to thank him for thinking to reach out to me for a session entitled I Was Wrong. I appreciate that, that vote of confidence. Um, so I thought a lot about what I wanted to talk about today. I've, um, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. Uh, I've been wrong, wrong a lot. I uh, thought about talking about, uh, you know, developer issues. I lead a team of front-end developers, so, you know, talking about testing your code or when to, when to deploy, when not to deploy, anything like that. Um, but I kept coming back to something that happened. Um, I think I was maybe a senior in high school. Um, I used to, I come from a, a very, I guess, joyful or um, a family that laughs a lot. I'm the youngest of five. Uh, we like to, to make fun of each other. We have very self-deprecating senses of humor. Um, you know, we always make fun of my sister because she has a little Tyrannosaurus Rex arms. Um, nice. and, but she, she, I mean, she does it to herself. Um, that was wrong. And, <laughs> um, but yeah, and I, I was, I like to make people laugh. I like to think I'm witty. Um, and sometimes I would, I would do that at other people's expenses. Um, you know, I like to make fun of myself, so I assume, you know, other people like to get made fun of too. Um, so I do that a lot, just trying to make people laugh. Um, and then one day I was sitting with uh, my friend Mike. Um, he's a friend of mine. I've known him since I think we were four. Uh, we grew up a couple houses down from each other. He's just an amazing person. Like he was um, Battle Victorian of, our, of his class. Um, he actually got an award for perfect attendance for all 12 years of school, wow. like a letter from the president. It's just the, the kind of guy that he is. He you know, graduated um, from the University of Arizona in like three years with dual majors in microbiology and like choir directing or something like that. <laughs> it's just the type of guy he is. And so needless to say, I really I respected him. I looked up to him a lot. And we were sitting there in a room and I, I don't even remember what I said. I cracked some joke, you know, at someone else's expense. And Mike just turned, at me, turned to me in like the most compassionate way. He just looked at me and he's like, you're a jerk. Like, not being mean at all, just like, you know, check what you're doing. Don't, don't say that about other people. And like to me, that's something I, I think back about a lot. Um, you know, I met, I was actually visiting him in New York a few weeks ago, and I actually told him this story, and he didn't even remember it. Like, he didn't even, like, you know, it was just an insignificant moment in his life. And I'm like, I'm even saying it now, I'm getting like, choked up. Because mm -hmm. it, 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 like, really affected me. Um, so now I think about, like, you know, if I'm on Twitter or something, and I'm about to say something snarky, because that's all I have to say. And like, I'll check myself and be like, you know, what would Mike do? Or <laughs> not really, but be like, yeah, I'll just keep this one to myself. Um, you know, be taken out of context. This might hurt someone's feelings. Um, it's not worth the joke. It even happened, um, you know, a few years ago when I first started with that, and um, we had a. 
um, I don't know, a client left a message in Basecamp and for some reason I thought like the actual words that they wrote taken out of context were hilarious to me. And I thought it would be funny for everyone else to see it too. So I copied and pasted it into, I think it was HipChat at the time with a comment, something stupid like, oh, and the client comment of the year award goes to, and then just pasted it there. And uh, my boss, Justin, our CEO, just sent me an email. He's like, don't, don't say that. Like, don't ever, like we have a standing rule, like one, don't ever put anything bad about a client in writing. And in general, just like, don't talk bad about a client in general, like we're on the same team. And, you know, of course I saw that email and I was like, oh, shit, what did I do? And I was super apologetic and he's like, eh, don't worry about it, just don't do it. So I guess the lesson for me is not so much, you know, you know, yeah, don't be snarky, don't, don't be a jerk, but, you know, take the time to, I guess, love someone enough to, to tell them, like, you know, you're, you're doing something wrong. Like, you know, don't, don't be a jerk about that, but, like, some t I feel like we go through life just kind of, without really knowing it, testing our own boundaries, like, pushing things, and it takes people to, you know, say, you know, don't do that. Like, it's not, you know, you're wrong. So I guess I would tell you to, or encourage you to, you know, tell other people they're wrong. Like, don't do it publicly, just take them aside and be like, you know, that people might take that bad, or, you know, you're hurting people's feelings, or whatever. And that's it. Hi, thanks. So, um, my, yeah, my name is Patti and uh, I come from Iceland. I live now in Germany. So, I didn't, we don't know what we are actually going to be talking about here, but actually, <laughs> yes, because this is exactly what I was going to say. So, um, actually my story or what I've been thinking about a lot uh, it's actually personal for me because it was actually difficult at that time. So it was like this that we were, or I've organized a lot of camps and in, in Europe and, and we were like organizing this camp, Drupal Europe, and it's gonna take place in September. And we've been doing this basically from September to December or January. And we were working really hard every single week. And then finally, we, it comes to the, time and moment that we announce where it's going to be and when it's going to be. So we announce it really like, hey, it's going to be in Darmstadt in Germany on this time uh, in September. And then people start tweeting. Um, and then came one tweet from a friend of mine. And he said, oh, damn, I can't get to that one. And I was so excited about our event that I immediately just wrote him like, hey, just reschedule. And I made like a this here, which uh, is like a blinker for those who are listening. <laughs> um, and then actually a friend of mine, he wrote me on a privately, he wrote me, mm, buddy, think before you tweet. And I'm like, huh? What do you mean? And then I noticed that there was a long tweeting list after this. And I'm like, oh no, did I do a mistake, you know? I actually asked somebody to reschedule something that is a religious holiday. And I felt terrible. And I felt so bad that I just like, it was public, it was on Twitter. Um, so I started to think about like, wow, I did a mistake. But then I actually realized we did a mistake. And that was actually, you know, the, the, I think the first thing, first to think about like I did a mistake of doing something like that, but then I realized it was something much more bigger than that. You know, we actually did a mistake of not thinking about make, having an event at a time that didn't fit everyone. So you can imagine what happens to, to you as a person. If I just take it on a personal level, like, I didn't know what to do. Um, I started to, like, talk to friends, and I had really good friends. 
that have been actually going and doing stuff like that themselves. And, and I was like, should I delete the tweet? You know, I was like, no, that doesn't, you know, what should that do? And I wish I had like a, some kind of a, a training book or a helping book, like, hey, what, what should I do now? You know, should I start apologizing personally? But then I actually have to do it on a much bigger level because we actually have to apologize or not. You know, because, so you get my point. Um, for me personally, I didn't sleep for a whole week. You know, I, I felt like terrible. And, um, and that's why, you know, it's really difficult to say it because it was just, it was a terrible five days in my life. So, yeah, so I never said it before, I think. So, where's the water? <laughs> so, basically, um, what I wanted to share is that, you know, we all make, you know, if I had been in a, in a party with all of you, and I had said the same thing, I think that you probably would have said like, hey, buddy, you know, and you would have corrected me correctly. But this is something that just sticks and is online. And I think like the biggest lesson for me is, of course, think about what you say in public, just generally. Just like you think about what you say to a person in person. And I think we all have to just learn from that. And that's probably one of the biggest thing that I really learned from. Um, then, of course, apologize for the mistakes that you do. So I think it is also really important that you just, you stand up and you also say, hey, I did a mistake. So that's maybe the next thing that I, I learned from that lesson. And, um, and just to add to that, because I have two minutes, because <laughs> it happened again the other day, but not in this level, and I didn't lose sleep for that. But uh, we all had the security update. And me, as very many other people, we were just tweeting like, Drupal get on, Drupal get on, and putting the hashtag. And then Tim actually tweeted, hey guys, think about what you're actually saying, because it could potentially hurt people that were back then involved for those who potentially made that, you know, that are responsible for that security leak that it actually hurts the people that were involved in that process. And now we are doing like security update parties and we are putting this hashtag to that. So I didn't think about it at all when I tweeted and put this hashtag in, but after Tim actually talking about it and he's writing a blog about it, I heard, <laughs> then actually you understand that there could actually, there are people behind it. And um, so therefore just think a little bit before you, you know, take your time before you say something or if you want to be, especially if you want to be funny. And I think like then especially you have to think one more time. So yeah, thank you for listening to that one. And I hope that, you know, we all can learn to be a little bit more, what do you say, nicer to each other. And most important, come to us in person to each other and Let's have that conversation and let's try to help to educate each other, right? Thanks. I'm not going to use the uh, mic or I'm going to like wander into the, the wall somewhere. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I'm Tim Plunkett and I am a senior developer at Acquia um, working on Drupal Core. Uh, pretty much full-time now. Um, so about seven and a half years ago, I started like my first foray into core, uh, working with Bardic theme, and about maybe a year or so after that, um, became what I called a core developer for the first time when I was invited to uh, participate in the, the Views in Drupal Core initiative. And so after, you know, after we successfully got Views into core, I thought maybe I'll stick around and do some more core work going forward. So, you know, I got uh, working in my free time, spending lots of nights and weekends uh, working on things. After about a year, uh, you know, I felt really comfortable with the, the way things work and how you go about, you know, achieving change and, and making progress in, in core, um, which turns out is awful. <laughs> uh, it's largely just the person who is 
the most stubborn and has the most time to spare gets their way. Um, and it took me a long time to, to learn this. So that's what, that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, so yeah, so if anyone remembers during the Drupal 8 cycle, they, had once, they announced uh, feature freeze is happening. Drupal 8's coming soon in 2012. Um, so a year after the feature freeze, feature freezes came and gone, um, and now we are, then there was an API freeze. And that was um, early 2013, and Drupal 8 was right around the corner. Uh, that came and went. So now we are in an API completion phase. Um, and by this point, with each impending, uh, like successive uh, date, you know, the, the stakes got higher, the pressure got higher, and uh, there was a sense of, a real sense of urgency that this was a, a very important thing that we must get done in 2013 and not wait, you know, two years till 2015 to actually get it done. Um, so, so, you know, working in the issue queue became a very stressful place um, for, for the people who had been working on this for, for many, many years. Um, and I've often thought about how stressful that was. But what, what I have taken away from this is how much worse it is for, for new contributors. Um, this was sort of before the, the new modern, uh, wonderful Drupal mentoring program that kind of has uh, become the, the, the canonical way to get people kind of involved in a, in a very caring and loving way. So this, that didn't exist yet. Um, there was a, a particular issue, I recall, um, that was uh, about some code that I wrote opened by another veteran contributor who he said, uh, you know, this is, this is completely terrible, we gotta fix it, you know, like it's garbage and, and like the Drupal could never work this way. And I, you know, immediately got my back up and was like, well, you know what, I will tell you this code is wonderful and then nothing, you know, could ever be wrong with it. Um, unfortunately, in the middle was a brand new contributor who decided that he really thought that Drupal was really great and wanted to finally get involved. And so he listened to the, the person who opened the issue and started to work on this and was sort of, you know, caught in the crossfire <laughs> between us veterans. Um, and uh, as anyone who has, you know, been in the core issue queues, there are some like choice issues out there you can go find where, you know, people resort to some pretty brutal verbal tactics that like maybe taken out of context seem polite, but are, are like pretty hurtful when, when read uh, in the moment by the people you're writing them to. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I said some things that now if you read, go back and read, you're like, oh, that wasn't that bad. Um, but it got bad enough to the point that that new contributor, uh, oh, thanks. Yeah, that, that'd be great. I kind of need one of those. Um, that, that new contributor uh, ended up quitting uh, not just Core, but Drupal altogether. Um, and, you know, I mean, there are large, like, there's got to be other reasons. It's not all my fault, I swear. Um, but I, I do think about that often. Um, and it's like, you know, the, I ended up being right in that I got my way. Um, I was the stubbornest one, and I, I, I took the most time and, and just kind of through attrition got what I wanted and wore everyone down. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's funny because it's like an admin UI facing feature. And every time I'm building a Drupal site, I click on it, and I go, oh, god damn. <laughs> Like, I'm glad it looks that way. It's wonderful. But like, is that, was that, that little thing, was that worth uh, losing, you know, a, a contributor? And like, how many, uh, how many contributors could that person have helped bring in? And what changes could, he, could they have uh, brought to the project? And was that one little thing, uh, you know, really worth it? Uh, and it turns out, you know, I, I may have been right. I may have been wrong. It doesn't really matter. It, uh, you know, it, the technical excellence of the project isn't worth sacrificing people. Um, and like, you know, I'm still here, I'm still, I'm working, I stopped uh, contributing largely in, in my free time because I'm, I'm uh, grateful enough to be paid to do it during my, as my day job. Um, but every once in a while, you know, it'll be like 5.30 or so and I should be done working and I, I open an issue and I try to go find something that was worked on by someone new and, and really try to give them a first uh, a positive first impression to kind of atone for that, um, because I was I was thinking um, the the second best Pixar movie uh, Ratatouille. Um, <laughs> in in that movie, there's the, the the phrase the motto of the one restaurant is anyone can cook, and uh, by the end of the movie, the you know the antagonist realizes that uh, really it's not that and everyone can become a great cook. It's that a great cook 
can come from anywhere. Um, and I think about that a lot, um, you know, being the second best Pixar movie ever made. Um, <laughs> and, and so what largely, like, my initial thing was that, you know, I mean, how do I, how do I learn uh, to best kind of uh, empower people who to, to do good in the, in the Drupal community, especially in Drupal core. And so I sought out um, Angie Byron Webchick, who many people know. Um, and I said, you know, I want to work, I want to learn more from her. Like, she was kind of the reason I got into Drupal in the first place, or Drupal core in the first place. Uh, so I applied to work on her team. And uh, that's how I got started at Acquia. And I've been there, next month will be four years, um, and we still work together. And uh, so I would not only, you know, encourage you to, 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 to better yourself, um, through reflection and, and thinking about all the terrible things we've all done to other people, but also to find someone who's a role model and find someone who you admire and, and lives, uh, is a, can be an example to you. Um, and yeah, that's, that's all I got. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Katrin Mulder. I know I have one of those funny names that nobody can ever pronounce, so I'm glad it wasn't printed anywhere because it <laughs> turned into Cat or Catherine or Falzaro. David's excellent at that. So my story is somewhat related to previous story. Um, I'm one of those people, I don't, I don't like other people. Like, this is like the most uncomfortable place for me to be. I would rather be somewhere in a dark corner and talk to maybe two or three people at a time. So. When I first discovered Drupal back in 2006, I didn't know anybody. I had no idea what was going on. I figured there's going to be a bunch of white dudes sitting somewhere, hanging out, drinking beer, making all the decisions, and that's how it works, right? <laughs> I know. And then I went to DrupalCon, and that was kind of the same thing, except one, one minor detail. I was staying at the hotel where the code sprint was at, and Webshake was hanging out in the lobby doing code sprint in the middle of the night. They mentioned that my room was right behind the registration next door to the elevator. I got no sleep. <laughs> I hated you all. I hated you all because you were having fun and that was not my kind of fun. And I knew that if this was it, I was probably gonna leave because it wasn't comfortable in any possible way. So I stuck around. I got my first Drupal job. I think I was pretty good at it, but I had no way of validating if I was because I would have to ask a white dude if I was any good. Because there were no women besides Webchick at the time. At least that's what it seemed. And then it was around the time of Drupal 5 to Drupal 6. And I had decided that our team was going to use domain access and it was going to be great. But there was no domain access for 6 yet. So I started committing patches, one after another, and Ken was really nice. He didn't tell me that I was wrong, or I didn't do it right, or you know what I thought, how it should work, was not the way to do it. And at some point, somehow, I was go contributor, and I was there, and it was magical. And nobody actually, I didn't have to go and ask a white dude if I was allowed to do it. He just let me be, and by enforcing my behavior, he made me feel I was welcome. And then that happened again with another project. And it was great. And suddenly, my mindset of I have to ask for an approval became I can do things and maybe somebody can learn from me. And so to backtrack a little bit, I grew up in Estonia. In Estonia, women teach, men decide, right? So for most people growing up in America, that's slightly backwards, especially for some European companies, uh, countries where that doesn't really happen, right? Women are in charge. So for me, it was so, so different. So I figured, why not? I got the time, I got the knowledge, I think I know what I do. So I started contributing more modules and more code and suddenly people actually wanted to participate and give me things back. And that was, that was great. So I was like, all right, I got this, I got this, maybe, maybe I can help somebody else. But this is where I went wrong. <laughs> I had become the white dude. 
right? And somehow in the process, I started to choose women over men because I was like, well, women deserve a chance, which is all fair, but at the same time, it's not, right? Now the women are getting preferential treatment over men just because they're women. So I guess what I'm trying to say is you have to check your own biases. You start from a point that seems comfortable to you, you end somewhere else, and you're doing exactly the thing you hate that is being done to you. So uh, that was back in the days of Drupal 6. So we have gotten so much better about being more open and transparent and welcoming, but it hasn't been an easy road. Like, how often does a woman walk around a DrupalCon and get asked, so are you a themer? Because a woman can't be a backend developer or a product manager. Because, you know, for the longest time, women couldn't code, right? We didn't have role models. We had the web chick. It, it's, it's been a journey. And what else? Another thing I would like to add to this is it is okay to be wrong, but also to realize that you are wrong and accept that you're wrong and learn from it. it it's hard and you have to admit it. And sometimes you cry about it. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. So I'm Heather Rodriguez, and I currently work at Digital Services Georgia. Um, <clears throat> I am a solutions analyst and former front end developer, but I didn't always want a career in technology like perhaps m many of us in the room. Um, in fact, where I went wrong was I let other people and my own insecurities dictate my future. So when I was in high school, um, I came down with chronic fatigue syndrome. So I was about 13 years old and I, uh, I started sleeping a lot. I was very sick. Uh, I couldn't go to school. I had home hospital teaching um, for, for, for actually a few years. Sorry, it's kind of hard to talk about. Um, but as a sort of a trade-off um, with the home and hospital teaching is that, you know, the, it, it was really kind of a self-paced curriculum. So I really didn't feel like I got the same chemistry and math and you know the sciences such stuff that other people my age did so i was really insecure about it but i was also you know a fairly you know smart kid and when i uh, went to college i went to community college first um, because my parents worked there so i went for free and also you know i just wasn't prepared yet. Um, I had just gotten back. I, as soon as I got healthy, I actually signed up as a foreign exchange student and went over and lived in Berlin, Germany. But I, that's another talk that we could have. Um, but yeah, so I was just really just, you know, like eager to experience the world. Um, so I came back and I went to community college and I took a lot of biology classes because I wanted to be a doctor. Because I was so sick, you know, I wanted to heal other people and I wanted to maybe help people like me who were suffering. Um, so I, you know, I, I had a teacher in my community college who really encouraged me and she was, you know, she was, um, she was a doctor herself and she had just moved to the area and so she was kind of like, you know, doing the community college teaching as just a, you know, side gig and she was like, you know, you're really good at this stuff. You should really do it. And I was like, I'm going to do it. All right, let's do it. So. I applied to the University of Maryland and I got in and as a biology major. So I went to the guidance counselor and I sat down and unbeknownst to me, apparently guidance counselors don't like to deal with community college transfers. They don't really like transfers at all. They just want to put you in a little box like, okay, you went to Maryland, you checked these prereqs, you know, et cetera. So the guidance counselor looked at what I had, you know, here, you know, here was my like, you know, 4.0 from community college, and she just kind of looked at it, and she just goes, yeah, we're gonna need you to take, like, 
Calc 1, we're going to need you to take um, organic chemistry and physics and all of this this semester and then the next semester. And she just rattled off the hardest classes possible in a very short amount of time. And I learned later that you just don't do that to people. You don't actually tell a freshman, you know, or, you know, whatever I was at that point because I was transferring to take, you know, physics, organic chem, calculus, all of these things in the same semester necessarily. Like, you know, you, you kind of throw in some filler courses, you know, so people don't just completely burn out. Um, but I was so insecure because I didn't have the same science background and math background that I buckled and I said, this is, this is not me. This, I, I, I can't do this. I, I would be a terrible doctor because, you know, I'm just I'm not smart enough and I don't, I don't have the background. And uh, yeah, I mean, these people all, you know, they, they all look like they're, they're probably going to be better doctors than me, you know. So I, uh, I cried and then I went over to the English department and I signed up as an English major because I was like, well, hey, I, I, I'm really good at reading. I like to read. Um, so, you know, that, that was, uh, so I got my degree in English and, you know, I don't, I don't regret it. And I don't regret the fact that, you know, I got an internship at the end of my tenure at the University of Maryland and we learned how to do HTML and CSS and then I started coding and then I had to um, participate on this committee to evaluate CMSs and that's when I found Drupal. So, um, you know, and I don't, I'm not saying that I'm wrong about the career path that I'm chosen, but I am wrong about letting other people tell me that I couldn't do it when I could because we're all winging it in some way. You know, we're, you know, you meet learned doctors and, you know, it's not like they have all the answers. In fact, they're just making it up as I go along too, right? I mean, you know, it's a myth, you know, that, that you know, with, with, with hard work and perseverance, we really, we, we can do this, right? And, and I really, um, I just feel, you know, so ashamed to admit that, that something that minor completely derailed my career, but... Yeah, that's, that's what I got. <laughs> Woo! Uh, man, uh, uh, listening to all, all of these, um, I like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wing it a little bit on mine because I'm going to sort of, throw out some of what I thought I would talk about because I think you all took it to another level. Um, so um, my name is Josh. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Pantheon. I've been involved in Drupal since uh, 2003, so a lot longer than I would like to admit. I don't know. It makes me feel old sometimes. but um, uh, And I've been so lucky in my life. Um, I mean, I work really hard, and I'm a pretty smart person, and I, I get along well with other people most of the time, but I've been so lucky in my life, and I have had so many advantages and privileges and just lucky breaks that have gone well. Um, and so when I was thinking about uh, David's topic originally, I'm going to do like the 60-second version of what I thought I was going to talk about, and then I'm going to try to put together something that's a little bigger picture. So I wanted to tell everybody how often I've like just made like mistakes, like like literally flat out boneheaded mistakes, like deleted the database in production mistakes. <laughs> uh, I've done that, um, and uh, and I think that uh, one of the things that I've learned as I've matured in my career, like let me walk back. Worst mistakes I've made uh, than dropping a database in production or deploying something that like, you know, takes down like hundreds of websites for a few minutes. Uh, I've done that too. Um, worse than that, I've been really uncharitable towards other people when they make those kinds of mistakes. Um, like I have, you know, high standards and I think it's great that everyone should have high standards, but sometimes I'm not a forgiving person and I can be very brusque in my reaction to something that disappoints me. And um, I had, it has been a long road for me to realize how destructive and toxic that can be 
uh, in a team environment and how corrosive it can be to building trust uh, between people. Because if you don't have the room to make a mistake, you are gonna slowly shrivel up and freeze yourself into a box where nothing interesting ever happens. Because human error is inevitable, it will occur, and we need to think of ourselves, our organizations and our technical systems as being a resilient system means you embrace the reality of human error and figure out ways to roll forward when it occurs rather than having to like pull the big red cord and have the screeching alarm go off and everybody run around with chickens with their heads cut off and then somebody gets chewed out in a closed office room. And uh, it's been, you know, I look back on, on my career and I've done a lot of really awesome shit. Um, and the stuff that I've done that's not often awesome has been being too critical uh, or being critical in, in a non-constructive way. Uh, and so, um, so that was like kind of my prepared career oriented, like, hey, people make mistakes, it's all good. Uh, and I think that's a good thing, but I think everybody here, I'm gonna try to tell a short other story about mistakes um, that I think will also end on a high note um, after some dramatic tension. <coughs> So one outcome of making mistakes is that you might get your heart broken. Um, and this is sort of the origin story of how I actually found my way into Drupal and it kind of comes up to the present day. So when I was 23 years old and I was living in um, an apartment way out in like the, like right on the gentrifying edge of Brooklyn in a neighborhood called Greenpoint, which was still mostly full of Polish people. Um, living in a uh, row house that I filled up with all of my friends from college that was originally had like a backyard that was literally a hoarder pile of trash. That we cleaned it out and we turned it into a cool backyard and we had barbecues and I went to a performing arts school. I have a Bachelor of the Fine Arts which means my version of imposter syndrome is just fake it till you make it so I got no problem with that. Um, and we were like, I was doing web development to barely scrape by and pay the rent, whatever I could get and I was doing performance art on the side and like living this like we really kind of cool but incredibly like stereotypically hipster lifestyle um uh i met a girl and she was amazing and she was like a little bit older than me like worldly and wise and she was in a band and uh and we like went dancing and then we like started seeing each other like every you know every other day and it was like this kind of whirlwind romance like i hadn't really felt since since i was a teenager Right, you know, like you kind of have fall in love when you're young, maybe the first time or whatever it is, puppy love, and it's this kind of overwhelming, all-encompassing thing. And that happened to me again, and I don't know how or why or what actually triggered that, um, but it kind of, you know, you get this weird tunnel vision um, when you're in that moment. And I was just like, this is it, this is so awesome, this person's amazing, it's everything. Um, she was, she taught chemistry at like the best public school in, in like Manhattan, and it was just like, we had amazing chemistry. Um, <laughs> and I was like, I had my life that I was working on and I was uh, you know, getting involved and doing things with web development. I was starting to get involved in politics at the time. And I had this plan to move to California for the summer to work on this political project that I was doing. And I was, she was like, cool, that sounds great. And I was like, yeah, you want, you want to come to Cal You have the summer off, you want to come to California with me? And she was like, I'll think about it. And I heard like, that sounds like we're moving to California together. And like that's a, you know, I have this like dream in my head of how that's going to go. And, you know, you can kind of probably tell where the story is going. Um, <laughs> you know, wonderful woman is like a few years older than me, has actually a life that she's built up over several years, uh, is kind of thinking longer term than maybe I am. I'm like thinking maybe like three months out is the, my, my, the, my event horizon. And it came down to like they're like a... a you know, about end of, end of May, and she was just like, okay, I, I've been holding on to this, and I really hate to tell you this, but I'm not coming to California. And I was like, what? And she was like, and probably you should just go, and then we shouldn't date anymore. And I was like, what? <laughs> and, uh, and like, you know, I like laid on the floor and cried for an hour. Um, and, uh, and I was like, very broken as a person as a result of that. Um, and so uh, coming out of that, so what did I do? I like, threw myself into this project because that's what you do when you've got a broken heart is you find something else 
uh, to work on. And I, I had been involved in this like anti-war organizing stuff. And uh, I'd gotten involved in this uh, political campaign. It was primary candidacy of this guy, Howard Dean. And it was like the internet powered candidate. And it was like speaking, pushing all of my intellectual buttons. And like I was a big believer in this. And moved to California and like found some like rich people in California that wanted to fund this thing and started a nonprofit that was going to like stealthily help his campaign on the side. Um, and like, you know, really did like got very involved in this. It was a life changing event. Like it was, um, you know, uh, I met my, my business partner Zach through that process. I got introduced to Drupal through that process. Uh, met Neil, got convinced Neil Drum to drop out of college through that process. Um, and, uh, and, and was like, you know, my whole, my heart was full again and it was f like deeply um, wedded to this. And, uh, and then like the, my guy like got just fucking shellacked, he lost uh, in a spectacular yeah. fashion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah! Haunts my dreams to this day. Uh, and I got, I was heartbroken and I, and like in a different way because I got, it made me like bitter and jaded and cynical. And like, man, because it was it was so it was so screwed up how it happened. It wasn't fair at all. And like, then of course, what you know, then we had fucking John Kerry, the long faced bandit, and like he wasn't gonna win. And we worked for him anyway. And then he lost just like we thought he would. And it was fuck. Uh, and um, and then I I took I took some time off after that, which was actually a really good idea. I went on a like I went on a road trip with some of my friends. We drove all around America and stayed at a bunch of nat national parks and saw a bunch of places we'd never seen before. And then um, at the end of that, I was uh, super broke and uh, like w actually went back and moved back in with my mom for a little while in Oregon because I didn't have any other place to stay. And I was like, all right, I better, better start working again. <laughs> uh, and it turned out that in that intervening kind of year and a half, uh, between the, the when the campaign stuff wound down, like I tried to have it like doing, I had to try to, after the campaign stuff wound down in the election, I tried to like do a coup against my nonprofit's uh, executive director, because like, it, which did not work, I got like half the staff fired. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we were all sick of it anyway, we were, we were all out, but it was, we, we think it was. <laughs> Yeah, we figured it might as well, like, if we could, we'll try to run it our way, and if they shoot us down, then we'll, we'll go. But it was, burn some bridges. That was not a, that was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Drupal had continued to grow and take off. Um, and, like, you know, we, I had this early experience of, you know, getting involved first just using this technology for this campaign, which was not, I wouldn't care about the community at all, because we're just like, go, 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 let's make websites, got to connect people and so forth. Uh, but eventually figured out that the community was a huge asset and, and was involved with that um, later on and kind of checked back in with the Drupal universe. And it turns out you could actually pay your rent with Drupal now, uh, which is awesome. And so uh, I called around to all the people who see me running these Drupal shops and I said, you know, I'm this guy, you can check my I'm user number 3313, I've got some commits, I've done some modules, I'm legit, hire me. Um, and Mike from Trellon hired me uh, and uh, that was an interesting experience, but it got me professionally engaged in, in Drupal, which got me, you know, to where I could move out of my mom's house, which was awesome. Uh, and I moved back to Brooklyn, and, uh, and as I started to work more with this community and started to think, like, even higher level about what we were all doing here, like, my heart started to get full again. And I started thinking about all the things that, like, the internet really would mean for humanity. And I'd, I'd had like kind of some early experience with this. I like had a, a, a blog back in the day where I would just like tell on myself and like be way, share way over sharing way too much personal information because it was like, but it felt like I, you know, it, I'm in a position of privilege where I can afford to do that and it feels like kind of living the open source life. And as I started to you know, see through the, Drup the rise of Drupal, how that, you know, not that everybody should overshare about their personal information, absolutely not, but that there was a way of, of being connected as a result of being able to exchange stories and, and make connections and so forth. And I got really, really fell in love with this idea of how this would really change the world and would make everything better because we could all connect with each other. And I think you might see where this is going. Um, uh, 
I didn't account for the fact that just being able to connect doesn't make people benevolent. And the, there's like, in a world where connections are possible, but sometimes the most like people with time on their hands and the biggest access to grind are the ones that can actually get things done. You know, all the jerks of the world can also get connected and, and do bad things. Like, I, I did not see that coming. Um, and, I, uh, and for me, it was actually like watching what happened around Gamergate. Um, I don't know how many of you followed that on social media, but that, like, that broke my heart. Because I was like, what, the internet isn't supposed to be like this. Um, but it, it can be. Um, and so uh, the positive note, so that's the dramatic tension. The positive note for me is, you know, even though that watching that happen in some ways broke my heart, I'm still, like my heart is filling back up again because now I think we're reaching a level of self-awareness about the risks um, and about the challenges of toxic online culture and the challenges of, you know, too much information being centralized in like an Orwellian box. And people are actually talking about this and, and not just with the kind of starry-eyed idealism that I had when I was 23 years old, but talking about it in a way that's mature and real and self-aware. And my heart is getting full again and I'm sure it'll get broken again. But <laughs> my, my point is that if you're not willing to risk being wrong. You're never gonna deploy cool stuff because you'd be too afraid if you drop the database and dropping the database isn't a big deal. There's always a backup. Um, but be, sure. be will, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> be willing to be wrong at the level that your heart might get broken. It's really hard to do. It's really hard to do and getting your heart broken fucking sucks. But Go there because that's how really great things happen. And, and, and you're, you know, you can't, if you, it's worth it to be in love, to, to, it's worth risking getting your heart broken to fall in love with something. And, and you can't know that you're right in advance. So be, you know, be brave and be willing to make mistakes. Be human. Be human, thanks. In absence of a David, I think that's it. Thank you all for listening. sick again and then I got a little better for a little while like certain drugs were more helpful to me and certain drugs were not I have uh, every single experimentative treatment that was possibly known to human beings at the time including giving myself shots every day um, I would say for me like the, it was just a certain amount of like building up my tolerance for exercise and for like walking around and stuff and then also supported with some drugs. Like, do you want specific games? Like, or, or cause our, okay. Right, right. Um, that time, cause we're talking like 97? No, yeah, like I mean there was, yeah, I definitely, you know, we weren't we weren't making smoothies, right? We were definitely we were just like I don't know, I don't know. This kid throws up all the time. What do you do with her? So, yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Huh. <laughs> Right. Don't do that. 
Right, right. And they just like and and because they don't really know what to do, like yeah. And a lot of it is they like they don't really want to be bothered or whatever. So they like kind of throw you through this and they're just like, I mean, you know, whatever. You're going to do it, you're going to do it, but like it's not a great idea. And you're like, but but wait, but I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just a fucking kid, right? Like cuz that's the thing, is that Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Fuck yeah! Good for her. That's awesome. That's so great. You know, and then and then went into teaching. Mhm. After a few years of teaching high school, she hated it and had to go find a new career. Right. It's just that you never imagine. You never know how it's going to work out. Mhm. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing your story with me. I appreciate it. Right, 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 yeah. Well, we might need to be moving. Thank you. So I know it's a little early, but for folks that want to pay attention to some of the commands you might see, you might want to come closer to the front because I noticed this is a little small. Just a pro tip. Oh, to follow along? Maybe, yeah. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with following along. Um, I'll also be providing the uh, link to the slides after the presentation's done so you have those as notes. So you don't need to take copious notes. Oh, very good. Yeah, all right. All right. Cool. It is, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Oh, all right. Cool. This is going to be great. And then I'll have to help you fix it after the talk's over. Yeah. So I'll, I'll make myself available for that as well, I'm sure. <laughs> no, there's no undo in infrastructure. Maybe there should be. Maybe there should be. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that, that, that should be like the next tool. Like Command Z for. Hello. Oh yeah, let's get that teed up and make sure that works. And then, yeah. Uh, 
No. Well, actually, no, yes, I do. I have a little video clip. Um, so is there like a little, oh, this is it right here. Thank you so much. All right, let's turn the volume down before I blow everyone out of the sky. Well, you never, you never know. Um, I mean, it is like the 215. People are, the blood sugar is going down and stuff. All right, let's get a Randar running. Output, HDMI, active. All right, what's the resolution on this bad boy? 19. Okay, I'm going to do 1080 on both of my displays. So that way I can just line them up and apply. Let there be light. I know it's Linux. Oh, thank goodness. It works. Okay. And then I'll play a quick, yeah.